This is a TFT display. We are going to make it show any data we want using a microcontroller. And some wires. In reality with this 144 inch module, which can be easily integrated into any your project, you can display numbers, text, pictures, animations and even make it interactive. For example, here it can display the potentiometer position in the form of a simple gauge. So in this video you will see how to connect this display to an STM32, set up the programming environment and finally display anything you want and in with some animations. Enjoy! This exact TFT LCD display has 16384 pixels. Each has 3 sub-pixels red, green and blue, which allows for different colors to be displayed. This results in a total number of LEDs inside the one display of more than 49,000 that should be individually controlled. However, as you can see this STM32 controller here has only 64 pins, so there is an issue in this equation. Clearly there should be something that allows us to multiply the number of pins to control the display. And there is. This functionality is provided by the display driver ST7735R, enabling the control of all 49,000 LEDs, using only 6 MCU pins. In two words, LEDs are controlled as a matrix with 128 rows and 384 columns, 3 columns per pixel. Rows and columns are managed separately by source and gate TFT drivers that are integrated into the display driver. I won't delve too deep into the working principle of this TFT controller because it is quite complex and can be quite boring. Just a quick look at these diagrams give me a headache. But just to give you an idea, this exact controller has 759 pins and I do not recommend playing with them unless it's absolutely necessary. Fortunately we don't have to as the controller manages all those pins by itself. The only thing we need to do from our side is to transfer the information that needs to be displayed via the SPI interface from the MCU to the display. SPI stands for Serial Peripheral Interface, which allows for high-speed serial data transmission, in our case from the STM32 to the TFT controller. Essentially, the serial data sent by the controller via SPI is then processed by the TFT controller and out in a parallel manner. As you can see, the display has 11 pins, but we will only need 6 of them to connect it to the MCU. You can see the functionality of each pin on the screen. And to connect everything together, I will use hookup wires, which may not be the most professional approach, but it allows to check the idea. The connection scheme for the display looks straightforward and not overly complicated. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Nucleo board, you might wonder why the display is connected to those specific board pins. I should briefly explain this. So each pin of this board has predefined functions it can perform. For example, not every pin can be used for SPI data transmission or serve as a clock signal for the SPI. Therefore, we must identify the exact pins capable of these functions and connect wires to them. So, to find the functionality of each pin on the board, you can easily search for it on Google or follow the link in the description. Obviously that in the program code later on we will refer to these pins by their names to control them as needed. Now when we understand the theory behind and have everything connected, we are ready to program the MCU and display our first dataset. So to program the MCU there are several options available. Personally I use an external programmer called the STLINK v2. Usually it is used when you have a MCU on its own, not embedded in a development board. However, if you have a development board similar to this one, you can simply connect it to your PC via a USB cable and program this device. Because this part of the board acts as a programmer already. Next, to write our beautiful piece of code, we also need STM Cube IDE, which is a programming environment. It is absolutely free. Additionally, you will need to download the TFT controller library, which allows us to display anything we want. Obviously, that without the library, you would have to go through the entire datasheet and manually create those communication signals according to the protocol. That's a lot of work, and life is too short for that, trust me. So just download the library using the link provided in the description. And finally, we are ready to start programming. First of all, we need to create a new project. To do this, press File, New, STM32 Project. In the window that appears, click on the Board Selector tab and choose the board you are using. 
In my case, it's the Nucleo L152RE, so I select it. Next, give your project a name and don't make any other changes here. Initialize all peripherals with their default modes. Yes, please. For the first time, this might take some time because it's downloading all the necessary libraries and files to create the new project. Here you can see the MCU that my development board has, along with all these pins and their connections. Grey color of the pin means that no function is assigned to them and they are free to use. Green and yellow means that they are used for something. So overall this interface is just user-friendly interface that significantly simplifies MCU configuration. You can simply click on the things you want to change and the corresponding code with the required setup will be generated. You can configure MCU timers, communication interfaces, chip frequency and pin functionality. And after the configuration and pressing the project build button, Cube IDE will automatically generate program code that corresponds to the functionality that has been set up here. Obviously it just simplifies everything, because writing everything manually would take an eternity and days of reading the datasheet. So it's fortunate that we don't have to do that and the IDE creates C files, headers and all additional necessary files automatically. So for now don't make any changes here and simply press Ctrl plus S which will generate files with the default setup. We will make changes a little bit later, after we install the library. So now we need to check if everything works correctly. We should check the debugger connection, because without the debugger connected we wouldn't be able to program the world. For that you just need to press project build all, then click on the bug icon, debug configuration and choose new launch configuration. Next, go to the debug window, choose ST-Link if you have connected the nuclear board directly through the USB cable and press scan. If a serial number appears, my congratulations, you have connected everything correctly. In my case, I use an external programmer, so I have a serial wire debugger connection. So if everything works fine from this point to program the board, it is enough to press the run button every time we need to. And if something doesn't work, if you have encountered any issues at this stage, check out this video in which I demonstrate how to fix some errors that might appear. Now we need to install the TFT display library. Simply download it using the link in the description and simply drag the files from the folder into the corresponding CRC and INC folders here. After you have your files copied, just press build project or build all to check if the newly added files have any errors. And of course there are, there are always errors. You can identify the errors by checking which line they appear in. In my case the library includes a non-existing file. That is because the name of the MCU in the display library is different from the one that my board uses. So I just need to change stm32fl1 to STM32L1. In your case, it should be the name of your controller, which you can find in the files here. Now the second error, which is related to the SPI communication. Remember I mentioned that the display communicates via the SPI interface and we need to define which pins of the MCU should be used for that. Now it is time to do that. So go to the .ioc file and choose SPI2 in the mode section. In the mode section select half duplex master and make no other changes. You can also see the pins assigned for the SPI here and check their locations on the nuclear board here. After that just press Ctrl plus S and the IDE will generate the necessary code to set up SPI communication. In my case I still have an error, because the library uses SPI1 for the communication, but we have configured SPI2, so I just need to change SPI1 to SPI2 and press build all again. After that, as you can see, the error has disappeared. After all, that's all we needed to do to make the library work. Now let's take a quick look at what this library actually can do. So the main file we are looking for is a library C file. This display has different functions that can be used to display everything. For example, draw pixel allows you to light up any pixel of any color anywhere you want on the display. As an argument, there are X and Y coordinates and pixel color. You can do much with it, but if you need to draw something small, that is a perfect tool. 
Another function is a write string. It has same parameters, but it also includes a background color and character font. You can find font options in the font.c file, which library also has. Fill rectangle draws an array of pixels that form a rectangular shape. You can change its starting position, width, height, and color. It is already a very powerful tool that allows you to draw different shapes and create some interesting stuff, and even animations by changing the rectangle shape and coordinates. It might also be useful for some simple graphical data representation. Fill screen function fills the whole screen with a specific color. You can use it as an eraser. And finally, the coolest one, draw image. Basically, you can draw any picture with a display resolution and even animate it. I will show you how to do it in a second, just after showing where those functions should be written. So we should write those functions in the main.c file. So open it. At the top, write several includes. Include st7735.h, testimage.h and fonts.h. It is necessary to use all draw functions inside the main file. For example, let's draw a simple text. Write its coordinates, font you want to use, color and background color. And here we go. The same goes for other graphical primitives. But again, the most interesting thing is images. For example, let's display one image from the testimage.h file. To do that, write draw image, starting points, which in our case are 0, 0, picture resolution, and its name. You can find the name in the header file. Let's just have a quick look how picture is stored in the memory. So as you can see, the picture is stored in the form of an array with 16384 elements, which basically corresponds to display pixels. And each element or pixel of the array is represented by 16 bits. So basically these 16 bits represent color intensity of each subpixel. 5 for red subpixel, 6 for green subpixel, and 5 for blue. That makes the total number of colors that can be displayed by 1 pixel to more than 65,000, which is 2 to the power of 16. So as you can see there is a lot of bits, and for one picture the number of bits is over 262,000, and that's really a lot and only for one image. At this point I think you have a complete understanding of how image display works and why its control requires several layers with TFT controller and libraries, because every single diet is controlled separately by the individual set of bits that the controller is sending to it. And it creates really really complicated structure. But for us, because we use several abstraction layers, it is really 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 simplified. So coming back to the test image. To display it, first fill the screen in black color and then draw the picture, which turns out to be a parrot. It was really easy to do, right? But what if we want to display a custom image, not this parrot? For example, we want to display a cat. As we already know, for that we will need to get a data array somehow. And for that we will need an, another application, called LCD Image Converter, which allows converting an image into a data array that can be written in the MCU memory and displayed. And again, it is a free software. So to display any image, first step is to find this image. For example, I want to display a cat image with a resolution of 128 by 128 pixels. Let's say I like this one. It somehow represents me. Since it has a slightly higher resolution that we need, we have to resize it first. For that, I will use Photoshop. I will also remove the white areas on the left and right sides and save the resized file somewhere. Now we have to convert it into a data array. Just upload the picture by pressing file open, then go to file again and select convert. The program will generate an H file with the dataset needed to draw that image. Also you have to make sure that you have the following color preset in here. R5G6B5, otherwise you will have problems with the color representation. Next I will open the H file with notepad. You can basically use any program you want because it doesn't matter. We just have to copy the file content into the main.c file. So just copy and paste the following data array into the testimage.h file. By the way, don't forget to copy the array initialization from the test image and rename the array. I will name it cat. That's it. 
go back to the main.c file and write draw image. Use 0, 0 as the initial coordinates, put the display width and height, and finally the name of the array. Press build project and run. And finally we have our polite cat staring at us. As you have guessed, any picture can be displayed like that, even a gif. I will continue with the cat theme and we will find something dramatic. Let's say I like this one. Now what we need to do is to adjust it to the display resolution. For that I will use an external website. The link also is in the description. Next you have to split it into frames. This particular GIF has only 3 frames, which is quite convenient for us. Now with these frames we have to follow the same procedure as with a regular image. Convert them through the LCD image converter into H files. Open them with a text editor like notepad and copy the content to the test image.h file. Now the only one thing left is to write only 3 functions and 3 delays between each frame. Oh yeah, C is a case sensitive language so I, I should write HAL in capitals and the D in delay as well. As you can see with a 50 milliseconds delay it is a bit slow, so just let's reduce it. And let's reduce it even more. So eventually I tested it with different delays and removed the delays altogether overall. So in this case when we have no delays, the time between each frame is defined by the time required to transfer each individual frame from the MCU memory to the display. I cannot really reduce it farther, and maybe for your GIF you need to have higher speed and the only option to reduce the delay in such case is to increase the transfer speed by increasing the SPI frequency. You can find these parameters in .ioc file. I also display the NyanCat GIF just for fun, like in the previous video with an OLED display. You should definitely go and check that video as well. In that video I use a OLED display which has a little bit lower resolution but also it uses another communication interface and other library. So in your project if you don't have to use a color display, maybe OLED is better option for you. Also it is a little bit cheaper. Thank you for watching, have a great day and see you in the next video. Bye!